Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start and I'm going to introduce our first two presenters. So um, we are going to start with Sammy Lowe from the Alberta Investigators Queer and Trans Health Collective and Tom Sorowski, who's also from Alberta Investigators and Queer and Trans Health Collective. So Sammy is a socio-environmental epidemiologist who specializes in how uh, the interplay between social determinants and environmental factors impact our health. He's excited to bring his experiences to the Alberta investigators and share his knowledge and passion for quantitative research uh, with members of the community. Tom is a second year medical student at the University of Alberta with a vested interest in LGBTQIA plus healthcare. He joined the investigators in the 2021 cohort as a community researcher and is now working for the Queer and Trans Health Collective as a monkeypox research assistant. So come on up folks and come present. I was thinking like, wow, that's such a great introduction. And then I realized we wrote those ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, thanks everyone for joining us, especially, you know, as we're nearing the end of the day and it's almost, you know, the freaking weekend. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, so today, Tom and I are going to share uh, a research project that we did, uh, were involved with last year that was led by a community-based mentorship program called The Investigators. A lot of you in this room may be familiar with that program, but if not, I'll touch on it in a little bit. Uh, just before we get into it, though, I wanted to acknowledge Finn, who is one of the uh, coordinators of the program, who unfortunately couldn't make it to the conference, but is such a central, crucial part of this work, so I wanted to acknowledge them, as well as the cohort of the investigators who did this study. So their names are on the screen. That would be Dom Dasty, Douglas Rusk, Heather Martins, Justine Basilan, Titus Chan, and then, of course, Tom here. Boop. So uh, the Queer and Trans Health Collective, which is the group that we're a part of and that facilitates the Alberta cohort of the investigators, is located in Amiskwichiswaskahagan, colonially known as Edmonton, which is situated on Treaty 6 territory in the Métis region of Alberta. And our participants in the study were from across Alberta, which included Treaties 6, 7, 8, and 10 territory, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta. So for those of you who don't know, what is investigators? Um, and the fact that it's investigators, I just, hilarious, <laughs> peak comedy. Um, so it is a program spearheaded by the CBRC that has cohorts across the country. And it's specifically about developing research skills, capacities, and competencies for members of the 2SLGBTQIA community. So building that capacity within our own ranks, so to speak. And the way that this program has been led specifically by the Edmonton cohort is uh, we've split it into two phases. So the first phase being the curriculum phase, where we share with participants the basics of research theory, such as community-based research and sort of ethical considerations, as well as some basics of both quantitative and qualitative research. And then what's really exciting is that for the next four months after, after the winter holidays is that they actually create their own research question and use those skills and knowledge to carry out their own research, which is awesome. And what I think is phenomenal too about this program is absolutely no experience is necessary. So we've had, you know, some folks that were in medical school or in graduate programs, all the way to folks with no second post-secondary, no research experience, you know, never opened an Excel doc in their life, but really wanted to learn some more of these skills. So one of the great things about being kind of a community-based group of researchers is we were able to really identify what are questions and topics that are important for us that we want to explore. And the cohort decided on this idea of how members of our community were identifying and accessing healthcare providers and services. But to kind of supplement a bulk of this existing work that is often quite deficits-based, we wanted to specifically identify and hone in on the elements of their experiences that facilitated positive interactions with the system to help kind of share that more broadly. So how did we do that? Uh, we thankfully had both qualitative and quantitative expertise on the team, so we took a mixed methods approach. The quantitative part of this study uh, took the form of online surveys that we promoted on social media. Uh, over about two weeks, we got 113 respondents, which I think is 
pretty good. Uh, and 82 of those completed the surveys that we were able to analyze. And in these surveys, participants were asked on a uh, wide array of questions from things like demographics, how they are finding and interacting with providers and clinic spaces, and then some of the features of those interactions. Uh, and then that was supplemented by qualitative work. So this took the form of two focus groups with a total of 14 participants, supplemented by four individual uh, interviews. And similarly, these interviews focused on questions around how these folks were finding care, the specifics of the affirming experiences that they were having, and then also some self-advocacy strategies that they developed or included into their own journeys with healthcare. And then at the end, we were able to come together kind of as a full cohort to really synthesize that data collectively. So in terms of who we heard from for the surveys, so you can see with the purple bars and the green bars is that we heard from quite a broad uh, kind of cross-section of folks with uh, self-identified different genders and sexual orientations. And one thing I really wanna, wanted to highlight, oh, one thing I really wanted to highlight as being quite excited to the point where I can't speak is that uh, almost 50% of our respondents self-identified as being trans, which is a much larger proportion than some existing data sets. So that was really exciting to see. Um, of course, most of our sample was uh, self-identified as white, but we still were able to capture kind of folks of different racial and ethnic backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses. Sorry that these labels are really small. Uh, and just over a third of our participants also identified as experiencing disability with cognitive, mental, and pain impairments being the most cited. And while we don't present the descriptives here, our uh, interview and focus group participants also represented quite a broad range of age, sociodemographics, gender, sexual identities, uh, and we were very fortunate, yeah. Thanks, Sammy. Um, so yeah, now let's take a look at the actual results from our surveys, um, as well as our in interviews. Um, so the first kind of question that we wanted to get at was um, how comfortable are participants with um, healthcare in general? Uh, so the graph on the left is just showing that about 37% of individuals uh, are not comfortable in healthcare interactions. Uh, and the graph on the right is showing that the majority, 82% of participants, would be more comfortable uh, in, self, uh, in healthcare interactions with self-identified to us LGBTQIA plus providers, um, which shouldn't come as a huge surprise. Um, when you kind of broke this down a little bit further, uh, we asked participants to discuss times when they were not comfortable in healthcare interactions. Uh, one theme that kind of came up a number of times was misgendering um, and the lack of respect for community members' gender identity. Um, additionally, some folks shared that they have received like ineffective and non-affirming care because of their provider's assumptions. Uh, we often hear about experiences that are similar to this, so a provider making assumptions about what body parts an individual has or what kind of sex an individual is having uh, leads to patients not receiving appropriate care or being offered care that is uh, incompatible with their needs. Um, uh, sorry again for the small font, but uh, while misgendering, misgendering and assumptions are harmful to a patient experience, we wanted to know what might lead to a positive experience for individuals. Um, so, for example, one thing that's always a bit scary when you go to a new provider is coming out, um, even though it's often necessary to receive care that's appropriate to your gender or sexual identity. Um, so we asked participants how their, uh, how their provider reacted to them coming out. Uh, we found that certain provider factors were strongly linked to a provider positively reacting to their patient coming out. Um, so the bar at the top is showing that if a provider just did something simple like introducing themselves with their pronouns, uh, they are 15 times more likely to ha have a patient that said their provider reacted positively. Um, as well, providers who use inclusive language were, again, almost 15 times more likely to have patients who had positive experiences. Um, so, so depending on how your uh, provider reacts, uh, that is one form of affirming care. Um, participants also shared other examples of affirming care in focus groups. Uh, for example, other than pronouns and inclusive language, participants really appreciated providers who took the initiative to learn about queer healthcare and who provide trauma-informed care as well. Um, this next um, graph is just showing, uh, we asked participants to rate their health on a number of different, um, so their physical health, uh, sexual health, mental health, and general health on a scale of one to 10. Um, and people who said that they do access an affirming provider rated their general health 11% higher than people who don't access an affirming provider. Uh, and this difference was found to be statistically significant as well. 
Um, and all three other domains of health uh, were higher in individuals with an affirming provider, uh, although these differences were not statistically significant. Um, so not only does affirming care impact self-rated health, but it can also affect health behaviors as well. Uh, so in our focus groups, the impacts of affirming care came up a couple of times. Uh, so community members with affirming care said they're much more willing to seek care in the future and to not put off problems until they became serious. Uh, additionally, individuals with affirming providers felt stronger doctor-patient relationships. Uh, all of this is really important to increasing health outcomes, uh, and it's important to kind of target both um, uh, better trust um, to encourage members to come back to healthcare in the future. Um, so yeah, so now we'd like to look forward and see um, where we can take this data and what the next steps might look like, uh, and it, to ensure that our community members get the care that they deserve. Um, so in this survey, uh, I think this is, uh, sorry again the font is so small, but I think this is one of the kind of uh, key parts of the project that I really um, wanted to see the results of. Uh, so we asked participants to select factors that led to a positive healthcare experience. Uh, so these were a number of factors kind of broken down, and this included things like self-space stickers, um, or uh, inclusive washrooms, or just uh, more abstract things such as having a positive reputation in the community. Um, so the thing that was actually rated as most important um, for having a healthcare experience was inclusive intake forms. So that's that long bar at the top. Um, although the second and third most selected factors were uh, 2S LGBTQIA plus resources and visible inclusiveness policies as well. But um, as you can see from kind of the variety of responses and the kind of equal size of all the bars, uh, there are a lot of different factors that are important for different folks. behind you. Oh, you're good. Uh, before I continue, I just want to say that a lot of those statistics that you saw, especially kind of the associations that we found, were analyzed by Tom, who had never done statistics before this program. So I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Don't take the results too seriously, is what he's saying. Oh my god, I looked at them, they're fine. <laughs> So anyway, continuing on, so in our focus groups and interviews, this kind of theme of having inclusive intake forms came up uh, quite a lot as well. And even simple features like having more nuanced options for pronoun and name uh, selection and specification, as well as kind of just avoiding using gendered terminology. But a key thread that was kind of woven in that is that that's predicated on this idea of consistency. So they need to kind of walk the walk the talk, so to speak. As one participant mentioned that they had an intake form, it seemed inclusive, you know, pronouns, preferred names, everything, but then there was a section in bolded that said four women only that talked about pregnancy. So quite a disconnect, I think, there between intention and practice. I keep waiting for somebody to like, next slide, that's me. Um, <laughs> In uh, both the uh, surveys and the qualitative interviews, other kind of factors uh, of clinics and healthcare spaces specifically that were identified as being kind of helpful and affirming are visible symbols of affirmation, so things like pride flags, safe space st stickers and the like, and having all gendered washrooms was especially noted in the interviews about um, just immediately making uh, patients feel more at ease being in that space. Uh, in the interview specifically, we were able to get at more of the nuance of some of these more, uh, some of these factors, pardon me, that are contributing to affirming experiences. So if providers uh, clearly had a specific knowledge of trans-specific health issues and trauma-informed care, that was much more reassuring for them as patients, um, as well as demonstrating empathy and compassion and, you know, surprise, treating them like a human being. What a wild concept, hey? Um, but one thing that also came out was a willingness for these providers to admit when they made a mistake or that they simply do not know. Um, and that was all great to hear. Uh, so just to close here, the investigators program, so the point of the program is to build this capacity and do the research. So we don't necessarily get into this project thinking, oh, we're going to generate, you know, a manuscript or a, a specific output, but surprise, we were able to anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what we were able to do uh, first is we had a community sharing day where we kind of presented our results and had open uh, communications, and I'm happy to say 
say that that was really well attended by both members of our community as well as healthcare providers that were really interested in following up with us. Um, and then also, we were able to uh, turn our kind of main findings into two tip sheets, which if I forget to say, we'll have many copies at the front on very nice paper. So feel free to come and take some. But just very quickly, uh, one finding was, or pardon me, one tip sheet uh, was based uh, or kind of targeted more towards healthcare providers based on a lot of the findings we've talked about today. So highlighting the factors and the things that they're already doing that are working great, they can capitalize on, as well as some relatively simple things that they can incorporate into their practice to help create more supportive and affirming spaces. And just lastly here, the other tip sheet covers a topic that we didn't get into today, but was about some of the self-advocacy strategies that came up during our work that we circulated to members of our community and are currently kind of trying to widely share. So again, feel free to contact us or take a tip sheet or whatnot if you feel that those resources would be useful for you. Uh, but with that, here is our contact information. And again, thanks for letting us share our work. Thank you, Sammy and Tom, for a great presentation. Uh, I also realized I forgot to introduce the title of the presentation. My bad, but it, uh, you, uh, <laughs> but it was great. Uh, now I'm actually going to remember to introduce the title of our next presenter. So Travis Salway is a, an assistant professor I'm in Fraser University, where he leads the Reaffirm Collaborative. He's volunteered in various capacities with the CBRC since 2008. And Travis is going to uh, present a binational survey of people 15 to 29 years old in Canada and the USA. Um, I'm, I'm surrounded by Albertans. <laughs> Um, it's so far, it's going okay. Um, and now that I know that some of you use statistics, I have some data for you, which I'll talk Please. about now. Uh, I want to start by uh, acknowledging the, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations who have stewarded these lands for a very long time, uh, where I am an uninvited guest and descendant of settlers, and I want to really appreciate um, uh, Elder Glyda Morgan for opening the conference in a good way and, and appreciate the other uh, indigenous people and, and elders who are um, uh, constantly offering ways for, for me and other settlers to, to be better allies. Um, and I want to thank the CBRC team who put the conference together because it's just outstanding, like really, really impressive uh, what you've done. So thanks for this opportunity. So um, when I was last here three years ago, um, we had uh, Matt Ashcroft and Erica Muse here as uh, survivors of conversion practices. And uh, when we opened that session, we reflected on how difficult it is to define this notion of conversion therapy or conversion practices. And I think the best definition around comes from our colleague Florence Ashley, who is um, the, the foremost uh, expert in uh, legal approaches to, to banning conversion practices, particularly with attention to those affecting trans people uh, really anywhere in the world. And Florence's book was published earlier this year. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It's a really nice read, not terribly academic, and we had Florence here uh, to give a talk about the book uh, last month. In the book, uh, they, they define conversion therapy using a very specific definition that I want to review because um, uh, it's not always what we think. Um, so really the, the kind of defining feature is that it's some kind of organized attempt, a treatment, a practice, a sustained effort, um, but what's really important is the outcome of repressing um, or discouraging not so much changing, but we, we have that term there, uh, but really trying to get people to deny um, their, their intrinsic sexuality or gender, um, or behaviors associated with a gender other than the sex assigned at birth. So this, would, this gets into the, um, the area of gender expression, whether you express yourself as too feminine or too masculine. Um, and based on surveys that have been done by the CBRC, by colleagues um, in Quebec, in the United States, we know that about 5 to 10 percent of, of queer and trans people have experienced this at some point in their life. Uh, thanks to uh, Matt Ashcroft, Erica Muse, and dozens of survivors of conversion practices, uh, the federal government moved to ban conversion therapy last year. Uh, the law took effect earlier this year. 
This is a huge accomplishment. Um, we should all be quite proud of this. Um, but we should be really clear that the mechanisms by which this ban are going to actually deter conversion practices are as yet unclear. There is a direct mechanism, I hope, in that you could actually prosecute someone who has broken this law. Uh, I don't believe we've seen any cases of prosecution yet. It's early days. Um, but I personally believe that where the real action is going to happen is through indirect effects of this ban. Now, one indirect effect would be it should have a chilling effect on the practitioners themselves. Unfortunately, we have 10 plus years of experience with conversion bans in the States, and we haven't quite seen the chilling effect we'd like to. Um, so the other mechanism, which is what I'm going to talk about today, is, is using this ban as a platform for education, uh, mobilizing community support, all the things that you're hearing about at the summit, um, to help young people who might be ambivalent or uncertain about how they can affirm their sexuality and gender and help them um, find a path away from conversion practices. Um, so that indirect uh, path is what I want to talk about. Um, the research, which I can tell you our, t our team has is just wrapping up a systematic review on all of the available literature on conversion practices, and the vast majority of research has been done with adults. And this is a problem because we know from surveys done here in Canada, this is uh, a student from SFU, Amrit Tuana, led this analysis where we looked at um, the distribution of the age at which people start conversion practices, and the median age is 17. And that's really consistent in Canada or the United States, which means um, Tackling this issue in adulthood is too late. It needs to be focused um, really uh, secondary school, if not primary school. Um, so we, we launched a survey earlier this year with support from CBRC, um, a number of people who are in the room here. I see my colleague, Dr. Olivier Ferlat, who knows a few things about this, and our research team, Martha and Sarah, are here. Um, and we wanted to know uh, three pieces of data that were prior to the survey, um, kind of things we were just making up, uh, that we thought would be important to mobilize educational efforts to prevent people from going to conversion practices. First, how many in the wake of the ban, so the law went into effect in January, and, and I think most of the media coverage was happening at, in the latter part of 2021, particularly when we had all party support for the bill. Um, so, in, in the immediate wake of all that media coverage, how many young people actually know that conversion practices are illegal? Because if you go back to those different mechanisms, presumably all of them require knowledge of this having been added to the criminal code. And then, fine, if they know, what are their perceptions regarding the effectiveness and safety of conversion practices? Because there is a lot of misinformation. And guess what? Our opponents who are promoting conversion practices are working quite hard to get the word out that these, these do work. Um, and finally, because where I think the real action is happening is in those interpersonal interactions among youth, how prepared are they to actually have a conversation with a friend who wants to go to conversion therapy? So we, uh, we ran the Unicorn Survey, Understanding Affirming Communities Relationships and Networks from March to August of this year. Uh, it was a huge effort. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your tireless work on this. Uh, we recruited almost 10,000 people, which is quite important because there is a lot of spatial variation in where conversion practices get expressed, particularly if we're looking south of the border at the US. We advertised on social media, so the Meta platform, and that's where most of the respondents came from. We also did a little bit of work on Reddit and TikTok. We adver advertised on Pornhub, and we had bus ads in Halifax and Ottawa. Um, and the sample is um, uh, primarily uh, young women and non-binary people. Uh, over half are women and non-binary. Uh, half of the sample are trans-identified. Um, almost everyone, 95%, are, are sexual minorities with the vast majority identifying as bisexual, queer, or pansexual. Uh, most of our sample come from Canada. 9% uh, are indigenous, 20% are uh, people of color, um, and the median age is 17. So we, we were quite pleased that we got very close to where we would expect people to be at the point of initiating conversion practices if they were unfortunately going. So overall, 45% um, of the Canadian respondents, so this is taking the, the US respondents out of the equation, 45% uh, did not know that conversion practices were illegal in Canada. Um, so we, we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of getting the word out, and I know CBRC and the C C S G D. <laughs> I'm working on my acronyms, uh, and uh, Wisdom to Action are doing some great work in this regard. 
Um, I wanted to look at, we asked people about uh, this kind of poorly defined concept of self-conversion practices because when we did interviews with conversion therapy survivors back in 2020, and Trevor Goodyear is here, he did a lot of those interviews, um, we heard that you know, it's, it's conversion, going to conversion therapy isn't really a discrete um, experience. It's more like people are in and out of programs over many years. They go to one, it doesn't work. They're going to try another one a few years later. And in between that, a lot of them are doing self-study. They're trying to um, pray. They're trying to read. They're trying to understand how they themselves can suppress their sexuality or gender. And, and sure enough, in Unicorn, we saw that 41% of those who went to a formalized conversion practice program um, also practice self-conversion um, therapy, which is important because this is outside of the scope of, of the federal ban. Now, I included this last statistic here because until this morning I was under the impression that the, the federal law uh, would not apply to people who voluntarily step into uh, conversion practices where no money is exchanged, but um, thank you to my colleague Bennett Jensen who knows a few things about the law. Um, uh, he clarified for me that in fact, um, no matter whether consent is involved or not, it is a crime uh, to, to practice conversion uh, therapy in Canada. Um, so that statistic that 12% of the attendees uh, actually went, uh, chose on their own to go to conversion therapy rather than being compelled by a parent or adult, uh, is still important, still informative in terms of how do we shift attitudes and perceptions, um, but Im also important to know that in those 12% uh, of the cases, uh, there would still be a potential criminal case to be brought. Thanks. Thanks so much, <laughs> Bennett, for what you've done. Um, encouragingly, only 5% thought that conversion therapy can work, um, although um, this we did see a difference by age where the youngest participants, those 15 and 19, were more likely to think that it could work. Um, and I do think that this is really uh, a matter of getting into some of those online spaces where there's a lot of uh, misinformation. What we saw happen during COVID, as with everything, um, the services moved online, which makes them both more accessible but also more insidious. They're quite hard to track down and figure out who is offering these programs. Um, and so we really need to keep a careful eye on what they're saying in terms of how uh, effective the programs are. And then this is my favorite uh, result from the survey so far. So we, we asked, what would you say if a friend said they were thinking of going to conversion therapy? And um, we had, you know, good, we had, uh, thank you, we had, we had about 80% say they would stop them. Good. Yeah, please stop your friends from going to conversion therapy. 3% um, uh, said they would support them. And But this is where I think really the action is. So 11% said they're not sure. So these people are in a place of ambivalence. Um, presumably they know that conversion therapy does not work, um, but they need our help to get the messages, resources, support out to uh, their peers who are contemplating conversion therapy. And 7% said something else. And when I read, they get to write in then in the survey, like, you know, what else, what else would you say? I just thought these were some of the most beautiful, empathic, um, just, uh, just incredible opportunities for us to be supporting um, peer-led education and, and support efforts. They said things like, I would try to offer other resources that would help them with their internal struggles, which I think is just about the best thing you could say to someone who's thinking of going to conversion therapy. I would try to understand why they came to that decision and whether they were being influenced by a person of authority. Again, going back to those interviews, we heard over and over again that people were going because they felt like if they didn't go, they would lose where, a place to live, they would lose access to money and resources. Um, and so in some form or another, someone in a position of authority or, or with money was influencing them. I would ask why they're thinking that way, because we actually need to understand the ideology behind this, right? Even if they were indoctrinated from a young age thinking that being trans or being queer is wrong. Um, and I love this one because, uh, you know, as we just heard in, in the session about monkeypox, a lot of this comes back to basic life needs and resources. I would let them know, like, okay, if this is a part of your religion um, and you're going because you think you have to do this to have a place to live, come and stay with me in my house. You know, what a, what a generous, beautiful offering. Um, if you've heard me talk about conversion therapy before, you know that I'm endlessly going on and on about this pyramid. And I talk about it because I really think that conversion therapy is is really, um, my public health brain thinks of it as just like a tiny slice of the actual fundamental problem here. So 4% of unicorn respondents had gone themselves to conversion therapy. A little bit lower than the estimates I showed you earlier, but remember these are young kids, median age of 17. They have not yet had the unfortunate opportunity to go to conversion therapy. But 69% said yes, a person in a position of authority, a parent, caregiver, a counselor, healthcare provider, religious leader, coach, 
ever tried to deny, suppress, change, or lead you to doubt your gender identity, gender expression, or sexuality. 69%. This is a ubiquitous experience for those of us who are queer or trans. I have lost count of the number of times when, in subtle or overt ways, people in my life, particularly when I was young, tried to convince me that this was not the way to go. And this is where I think the educational efforts can also be quite beneficial. And in fact, we see that having experienced what we call SOGIS, these kind of nudges away from uh, queer uh, identities and experiences, um, these are associated with conversion therapy. And in fact, they might be precursors to conversion therapy. So let's work on these, um, these activities. And our team is doing this work. Martha's looking at how does this manifest in organized sports and team sports. And Sarah's looking at how does this come out in sex ed. These are spaces where we actually could influence a lot bigger cross-section of the queer and trans youth community. Um, so I want to thank, in particular, Theana, who uh, has run these analyses for us. And, and in addition to Martha and Sarah, Stephanie and Andres worked really tirelessly on this uh, survey. Uh, and thank you to our funders, uh, notably including um, Shirk and uh, Andrew Beckerman. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, happy to hear thoughts or questions at any time. Thank you, Travis, for a wonderful presentation on a really powerful topic. That was really great to hear uh, all the progress that's being made to counter conversion therapy. Um, so continuing on with our next two presenters, who will present our next presentation. Uh, Tediwa Nemutambwe is a youth research associate who uses she, her pronouns with the Reimagine BC study and is also an activist who is passionate about black liberation, QT BIPOC, social justice issues, uh, and disability justice. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and a background as a pure health educator. Tadiwa is also, also works as a customized employment team lead at CBI Consultants with a focus on inclusive employment for folks with diverse abilities. Kalisha Claussen, who also uses she, her pronouns, is a postdoctoral fellow with the Center on Gender Equity and Health at the University of California, San Diego, and the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University where she leads and supports uh, Reimagine BC and other CBR projects centered on gender equity and relationship dynamics. They will be presenting a, a youth-led community-based qualitative research study protocol on uh, relationship and gender equity measurements among gender-inclusive young women and non-binary youth in British Columbia. Hey, thank you so much, everyone, for, for having us here today. And I, I especially want to thank the CBRC for uh, allowing us to be here and a lot of our team to be here, uh, including many of these folks on this picture here. I'm um, really grateful. And um, yeah, so th thank you so much for having us. All right. Uh, and with that, I'll start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I am an uninvited guest um, to the beautiful lands of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations, uh, who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. So we're going to take you through a bit of a background on why we're doing this work, uh, present some of our objectives and methods, and then reflect a bit on our process, uh, as well as uh, present a discussion on this. All right, so for a bit of background on our study, um, we really wanted to look at uh, gender inequity, which is a structural, structural determinant of health and a global and national health priority. Um, and with that, uh, gender equity itself can only be achieved by really addressing inequities according to the needs of individuals um, across the gender spectrum. Um, uh, and then uh, we really wanted to look at gender and relationship inequities um, and really wanted to highlight that queer and trans uh, young women and non-binary youth uh, may face greater uh, relationship inequities um, such, such as intimate partner violence um, and other uh, negative health outcomes uh, more than cisgender uh, heterosexual uh, young women and men. But what we know about relationship inequities um, is so based in the, 
heteropatriarchy, um, and many of the measures that we use in especially quantitative health research have been developed and conceptualized among mostly cis women that are married um, and in monogamous relationships. And so that means that the current measures that we have uh, to understand inequities in relationships, such as controlling behaviors, um, and, you know, decision-making dominance, and experiences of intimate partner violence may not be applicable uh, to many folks, including non-binary or trans individuals, uh, folks that are in a diversity of different relationships, including um, you know, uh, open relationships or polyamorous relationships. Also, a lot of these measures were developed you know, two decades ago or more, um, and so they may not be applicable in the current era uh, or applicable for a diversity of young women and non-binary youth across different sexual, sexual orientations, ethnicities, um, and socioeconomic statuses. Uh, with that, our aim really is to improve uh, gender and relationship uh, equity measurement um, by really centering um, the lived and living experiences of queer and trans youth. Um, to really create uh, research and programming that is um, efficacious and effective, um, as well as uh, very, yeah, and inclusive, sorry. Um, and so we're gonna take you through kind of the process of our research, uh, which really aims to um, look at, you know, how uh, queer and trans um, youth uh, perceive gender equity in their relationships, as well as um, how they understand the current measures of uh, gender and relationship equity. All right, and uh, we are still recruiting for our study, so please feel free to scan the QR code, shameless plug. Um, we have currently done about 21 interviews, which is great, and we hope to complete 30 interviews. Um, so yeah, please scan the QR code, share. Um, <laughs> to be eligible for this study, um, one, uh, can identify as a woman or non-binary youth aged 16 to 29 um, living in British Columbia uh, and you're able to attend an interview via Zoom um, as well as you'd have to be uh, in a current or recent in the past 12 months um, relationship that they identify as non-heterosexual or non-monogamous and able to provide uh, oral informed consent in English. So for this work, we're using several different theoretical frameworks, um, including a number of feminist approaches, uh, including intersectionality uh, and relational gender theory, which really acknowledges that gender is very multidimensional and formed and performed within different institutions and across different relationships. And we're using, obviously, hence why we're here, a community-based research approach, um, which really centers youth experiences um, and meaningfully involves young people in all stages of our research process. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at some of uh, our methods and objectives. So our first objective was really to build uh, Reimagine's youth engagement approach and an emphasis on youth. Um, and so with that, we have a youth advisory committee comprised of 10 amazing youth, um, as well as three youth research associates, so that includes myself um, in this study. Um, please check out our poster if you haven't, if you haven't already. Uh, last night we had our, our poster up, and it has a bit more on the youth engagement uh, approach, which is central to uh, our research. Yeah, and so youth are helping with a number of these different study activities um, to fulfill our study objectives, uh, including these ones listed here. Um, so yeah, our next objectives, uh, one of them is to explore youth perceptions of existing measures. Um, and so we have been conducting um, intersectional cognitive interviews. Um, I myself, as a YRA, have had the pleasure of conducting multiple of these interviews. Um, and then our other objective is identifying recommendations. Um, again, an em emphasis on youth. And so these youth identified recommendations uh, will inform um, scales, adaptation, uh, refinement, additions, modifications um, for scales to come. 
Yeah, so as Tadiwa mentioned, we're conducting uh, cognitive interviews. And so these are, these, this is a method that often gets used to understand how people answer questions in quantitative surveys. Um, and so it, it uses different questions to um, allow participants to, to explain a little bit in more detail why they might answer a Likert skill. Um, for example, one of the questions that we're asking in these cognitive interviews um, is who has more power in your relationship with participants being able to answer you know, themselves, um, their partner, or e each equally, um, as well as if they're in number of different relationships, they could answer um, themselves, you know, at least in some relationships, one of their partners, or um, in all of their relationships, them. Uh, and so this, this uh, cognitive interview with, and the measures that we're looking at have really been informed by both the Youth Advisory Committee as well as the youth researchers. Um, and they also go through a series of probes to, to understand whether the items in the scales that we're asking about are applicable to their relationships. Um, and also we've asked them to imagine if they were to, to ask their friends or their peers if they had gender equity or equity in their relationships, how might they ask that? And we actually ask this as one of the first questions before going into the scale, um, as well as at the end to see if there's anything missing from the items that we've asked. Um, and we'll be looking at, at these data um, intersectionally to understand if there's issues in these items in the scale um, or things that are missing that might be different across uh, different identities. And our final objective uh, is really to explore how youth of diverse genders and relationships experience and understand gender equity in their relationships. Uh, and so we're using a collaborative, reflective thematic analysis with, again, the YAC and the YRAs. Um, a lot of it is being done using Google Jamboard, um, which if you are not familiar with, is essentially putting a bunch of stickies on a virtual whiteboard um, and trying to understand together um, what some of the data means. And so this is just an example of one of the activities that we did at our last Youth Advisory Committee meeting um, where we kind of showed the, or we sent before the, the meeting some different quotes around um, gender equity in relationships that participants were bringing up. Um, and we had them kind of populate different ideas around what they were gathering from this. Um, and then organize these into kind of what makes sense to them. How are these grouping together? Um, and you can see here that on, I guess, your left side of the screen, um, these are things that participants thought were more either related to themselves as individuals or internal to the relationship. Um, and then on your right, um, things that were more outside of the relationship. But that then there were cross-cutting themes, um, so things around violence, um, capitalist related, so things around financing, um, financial or job, or kind of scheduling. And yeah, this, this wasn't a complete exercise, and this is very preliminary data, but kind of just to get them thinking about um, the themes that are in our data and, and how they make sense of it. Uh, and I had the pleasure, uh, as, as I mentioned before, of completing um, some interviews and a lot of themes around, you know, gender equity itself um, came up and the youth were amazing at coming up with their own kind of definitions of it, um, which is really pivotal to this, um, really, um, and speaks to our youth engagement approach and being youth led. Um, a lot of uh, discussion around power also came up in a lot of um, the interviews, as well as societal kind of pressures and influences on um, uh, their perceptions of gender and relationship equity. Right, um, and now I'm gonna speak uh, a bit on my own reflections um, as a youth research associate on the study, um, really kind of centering you know, our youth engagement approach. And I'll just mention that just from the beginning of the study, um, like, you know, with recruitment of youth research associates, um, I myself felt like really seen um, with just even the job posting. Like it was like, 
this is for you, queer black woman. Come and be on this study. Um, instead of like some other job postings where I'm like at the bottom, it's like, you know, people of minorities are, you know, um, <laughs> welcome to apply. So <laughs> it was really cool to see that and just even the, the whole like onboarding process and everything was, you know, we was youth engaging. Um, we spoke up about what we wanted, how we wanted things to go, and it felt great. So it's been, a, it's been awesome. Um, the interviews ha have been going really, really well, and our other YRAs are amazing and like so good at conducting interviews and so calming, so definitely like sign up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have you know wonderful opportunities to engage with the Youth Advisory Committee, and I just want the study to go on forever. So yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, and with that, uh, we'll kind of end with our discussion here. Um, so really, you know, we want to emphasize that queer and uh, trans youth across BC um, are teaching our team uh, about best practices um, in gender uh, and relationship equity data um, that's truly informed by their lived and living experiences. Um, the re results that we're going to uh, get from all these interviews and data analysis um, will be shared with uh, diverse audiences, including our studies youth advisory committee um, via youth-led outputs such as podcasts, videos, etc. Um, and ultimately, uh, the results from the study will be used to address gender and relationship equity data gaps um, to dismantle um, societal power structures, um, norms and practices that prevent um, queer and trans youth from accessing and enjoying equal rights. So I'm really excited about this research, and I hope you all are too. Um, a big thank you um, to all our uh, community members, community experts, um, and uh, our research team, and our funders, um, including the C CBRC. Um, so yeah, thank you all so, so much uh, for your time and attention. And yeah, we'll take questions and comments later, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tadisha, and uh, sorry, Tadiwa and Kalisha. I think that we have so many good presentations on this panel that uh, it's going to be hard to um, manage the questions. I assume we're going to have a lot, so please, folks, keep in mind that you also can come see the presenters after the the uh, session is done, so you can chat with them individually as well. But we will have time for questions at the end. Et finalement, je vais introduire notre dernier présentateur euh, du panel, qui est Maxime Gaudette, qui va nous présenter la euh, présentation « Une arme à double tranchant, les effets des applications de rencontres gays sur la santé des jeunes hommes gays, bisexuels, trans et queer ». Maxime est un étudiant queer au doctorat en sciences politiques avec l'option de promotion de la santé. Euh, il est inspiré par le militantisme et les approches critiques. Maxime se spécialise sur les pratiques sexuelles marginalisées et stigmatisées au sein même des communautés 2S LGBTQI+. Sa recherche doctorale porte sur le consentement dans des contextes de consommation sexualisée. Euh, donc, Maxime, je te laisse présenter. Oui. Bonjour. Um, so today's presentation is in French, but I do speak English, so if you're, you, I welcome questions in, in English at the end if you have any. Um, je m'appelle Maxime et je suis à l'Université de Montréal, un étudiant au doctorat. Je suis aussi membre du euh, laboratoire de recherche communautaire Collab. Aujourd'hui, je vous présente les résultats d'une recherche euh, que j'ai participé comme assistant de recherche euh, sur les applications de rencontre. Donc, euh, Rapidement, euh, je vais un peu mettre en contexte la recherche pour vous parler des objectifs, ensuite des méthodes, euh, pour continuer avec les résultats et enfin euh, une discussion et conclusion assez, assez typique pour une recherche. Donc, pour, mettre un peu, euh, pour vous mettre un peu en contexte, les applications de rencontre, euh, que je vais peut-être appeler à, à travers le reste de la présentation « appli » pour des raisons de, de fluidité, donc « apps » en anglais. Euh, donc, les applis sont utilisées, c'est des technologies interactives qui sont hautement utilisées par euh, les hommes gays, bisexuels, queer et trans. 
et qui, euh, qui ont des effets à la fois positifs et négatifs. Euh, la littérature documente euh, des effets qui sont positifs et des effets qui sont négatifs. Par contre, il y a peu de données sur les jeunes, donc les jeunes hommes gays, bisexuels et queer, que je nommerai pour le reste de la présentation euh, de jeunes ou de jeunes queer. Et il n'y a aussi aucune recherche à notre connaissance avec euh, les professionnels de la santé, donc qui s'intéressent aux perceptions et à l'expertise des professionnels de la santé. Donc, dans ce contexte-là, on voulait euh, examiner les perceptions des professionnels de la santé concernant les effets des applis sur la santé et le bien-être des jeunes queer. En ce qui a trait à nos méthodes, on a, on a opté pour un devis euh, d'études descriptives qualitatives, entre autres parce que c'est un devis flexible qui nous permettait vraiment de répondre à notre question de recherche, qui nous permettait vraiment de, de, son, de se plonger sur euh, quels sont les impacts. Et on a récolté les données auprès de 28 professionnels de la santé euh, qui travaillent dans différents milieux, entre autres de la santé sexuelle, santé mentale ou euh, en dépendance, et qui travaillaient tous avec des jeunes, euh, des jeunes queer et trans, entre autres en Colombie-Britannique. Les données ont été récoltées à travers d'entretiens de, semi-dirigés et analysées avec euh, une analyse de contenu. À droite, gauche, bref, dans la bulle, vous avez les caractéristiques sociodémographiques des participants, un résumé des caractéristiques sociodémographiques. Nos résultats se résument en trois grandes catégories euh, qui sont le plus, euh, le, le mieux décrit par un des, une, des, une des citations des participants, les décrivant comme une arme à double tranchant, donc qui illustre vraiment le fait que les applis peuvent avoir des effets à la fois positifs et négatifs qui existent simultanément. Donc, on va regarder les trois catégories une par une. La première réfère au fait que, selon les participants, les applis contribuaient à une sexualité qui était euh, plus transactionnelle, mais aussi plus épanouissante. Donc, d'un côté, la sexualité était vue comme étant plus transactionnelle et on ne se référait pas nécessairement euh, par transactionnel. Les, les participants ne voulaient pas mentionner un, un échange d'argent euh, pour, pour, un, pour un bien ou pour un un service, mais vraiment se référerait davantage à la dynamique de l'interaction. Donc, avec les applis, c'était beaucoup plus facile d'avoir euh, de la sexualité, euh, elle était plus accessible, mais en même temps, elle était moins engageante et euh, contribuait un peu à, à, à objectifier les, les communautés, euh, les jeunes queer. Dans le, dans le même ordre d'idée, les, les professionnels de la santé argumentaient que les applis contribuaient à une, à une sexualité qui était moins intime ou qui était moins émotionnellement significative ou moins engageante en tant que telle, donc plus transactionnelle à ce niveau-là. Mais en même temps, les professionnels de la santé reconnaissaient aussi que, de l'autre côté, les applis permettaient euh, aux jeunes d'avoir le sexe qu'ils désirent. Donc, ça leur permettait d'avoir une sexualité qui était plus épanouissante, entre autres en facilitant euh, la, la quête ou en facilitant le, le, le fait de trouver des partenaires sexuels compatibles. Donc, les applis facilitaient les discussions sur non seulement les préférences, mais aussi les limites, qui peuvent être des conversations euh, plus complexes ou plus difficiles à avoir en face. Euh, donc, l'échange des applis, donc d'en de, discuter par écrit, permettait, euh, selon, les, selon les participants, de contribuer à un, une sexualité qui était plus respectueuse, plus épanouissante. En même temps, euh, ça, ça facilitait de, la négociation de rapports sexuels sécuritaires dans, dans, dans cette même ordre d'idée-là, de pouvoir en négocier euh, avant même de se rencontrer face à face. Puis, les participants ont aussi mentionné que ça contribuait à un sentiment de liberté, de découverte, peut-être d'autant plus important pour les jeunes qui sont en découverte de leur sexualité ou qui craignent d'être stigmatisés pour leur queerness. Donc, euh, ça facilitait de ils pouvaient bénéficier de leur sexualité en évitant un peu euh, ce, cette stigmatisation-là. Le deuxième thème, euh, pardon, la deuxième catégorie réfère... Euh, au fait que les applis contribuaient à un sentiment de communauté, de sécurité, euh, mais qui euh, augmentait aussi le, le risque ou la, la quantité de discrimination et de stigmatisation qui était vécue par les communautés. 
entre autres, euh, d'un côté, le sentiment de, de communauté et de sécurité s'expliquait que les participants euh, nommaient que euh, les applications de rencontre facilitaient des, des connexions entre, entre jeunes, entre jeunes queer ou entre, avec d'autres personnes queer pour des raisons qui, qui allaient au-delà de la sexualité, donc des raisons qui, qui surpassaient la, la sexualité. Ça permettait de trouver d'autres comme soi et ça permettait vraiment de faciliter justement ces, ces, ces relations inter interpersonnelles qui permettaient du coup de réduire le sentiment d'isolement. Les professionnels de la santé disaient que c'était d'autant plus important pour euh, les jeunes trans ou en, les, les jeunes euh, queer qui vivent en milieu ruraux qui ont souvent moins accès à des lieux de socialisation queer. Donc ça permettait vraiment de, 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 de créer ou de faciliter ce, ce sentiment de communauté. De l'autre côté, de l'autre côté, euh, les, prof, les professionnels de la santé, donc les participants, euh, nommaient que les applications augmentent aussi la stigmatisation, la discrimination, euh, entre autres en ce qui a trait à la transphobie, la grossophobie, le racisme et la stigmatisation contre le VIH. Donc, les, les applis servaient, selon les professionnels de la santé, les applis servaient davantage les intérêts euh, de ceux qui incarnent la masculinité blanche, donc des corps blancs, des corps masculins, des corps musclés, euh, au détriment des corps noirs, des corps de couleur, des corps gros euh, ou des corps efféminés. Donc, les, euh, les professionnels de la santé nommaient que les jeunes sont souvent confrontés à des messages stigmatisants comme euh, « no femmes euh, »,« no Asians », des, des, donc pas d'efféminés, euh, pas d'asiatiques, pas, pas de gros, des messages stigmatisants comme ça. Et selon une, une de nos participantes, euh, elle expliquait que la distance qui est créée entre les, les utilisateurs, du fait qu'ils qu sont derrière leur téléphone, vient peut-être augmenter cette violence-là, vient contribuer au fait que euh, cette violence-là est d'autant plus fréquente. Elle nommait, par exemple, que en, en, dans la vraie vie, euh, les gens ne viendraient pas te dire de face euh, « je ne suis pas intéressé par les gros, par les efféminés ou par les asiatiques », où ce serait beaucoup moins fréquent que sur les applications de rencontre. On peut lire ces messages-là plus fréquemment. Euh, puis, ce rejet qui pouvait être répétitif pour, euh, pour ces communautés minorisées au sein même des communautés queer, euh, pouvait créer un sentiment d'indésirabilité, donc se sentir non désirable et qui peut avoir des effets négatifs sur la santé. Enfin, la troisième catégorie euh, reflète le, le risque augmenté lié aux ITS et aux drogues. Donc, d'un côté, euh, les, euh, côté le, les applis contribuent à augmenter les, les risques liés à, aux infections transmises sexuellement et aux drogues, mais en même temps ont un bon potentiel ou un potentiel important en ce qui a trait à la prévention et à l'intervention. Donc, d'un côté, euh, le fait que le, la sexualité était beaucoup plus accessible sur les applis euh, était probablement lié, selon les professionnels de la santé, au, au taux euh, d'ITS dans ces communautés-là. Aussi, il nommait que, puisque les applis euh, facilitent ou encouragent souvent des interactions sexuelles qui sont anonymes, où peu d'informations euh, personnelles est échangées entre les personnes, donc ça complique le fait, euh, ça complique d'avertir les par les, nos partenaires lorsqu'il y aurait un, un test positif à une certaine ITS, donc qui complique euh, le « contact tracing », comme on dit en anglais. Ensuite, sur les applis euh, question de rencontre, il y a un accès qui est assez, euh, assez flagrant à ce, qui a trait, à ce qui a trait aux drogues illicites. Donc, les professionnels de la santé étaient surtout inquiets pour euh, les jeunes queer qui n'étaient pas encore euh, en contact avec les, les substances illicites. Donc, ça créerait davantage d'opportunités pour la consommation ou ceux qui vivent avec des problèmes de consommation et qui étaient exposés justement à, à ces, à ces triggers-là de, de consommation. Entre autres, sur les applications de rencontre, euh, le chemsex, qui est la consommation sexualisée, est un phénomène important selon les, les participants et pourrait justement augmenter les opportunités et, euh, et l'exposition à, à ce phénomène-là. Finalement, euh, de l'autre côté, euh, les, les applis sont d'importantes opportunités de prévention et euh, d'intervention. 
Donc, les professionnels de la santé nommaient que les campagnes de sensibilisation et de la promotion des services de santé peuvent rejoindre un plus grand public avec les applications de rencontre. Donc, la, la technologie facilite euh, le transfert d'informations à ce niveau-là. Sinon, les participants nommaient aussi qu'il y a un, une certain, un certain phénomène d'éducation entre les utilisateurs, donc à travers leurs discussions sur leur sexualité ou leurs intérêts ou euh, s'ils sont sur PrEP ou non, euh, ça, ça, ça crée des conversations qui contribuent à, à éduquer, euh, à, à l'auto-éducation, si on veut, et s'éduquent entre eux, euh, entre, entre les jeunes. Les, les professionnels de santé disaient aussi qu'eux-mêmes utilisent parfois les applications de rencontre pour, euh, comme lieu d'intervention. Ils voyaient vraiment un potentiel là, surtout, euh, surtout en ce qui a trait à, à, à rejoindre des populations qui sont plus éloignées des populations qui vivent, des, des populations queer qui vivent dans des régions rurales. Enfin, euh, les, euh, les professionnels de la santé ont aussi exprimé beaucoup de frustration à l'idée que, selon eux, les, les corporations d'applications de rencontre pourraient faire beaucoup plus pour euh, prévenir ou pour... Euh, pour, pour, pour promouvoir euh, la santé des jeunes, comparé à ce qui est, euh, à ce qui est fait aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, en guise de, de conclusion, on se rend compte que les, euh, les applications de rencontre qui facilitent la sexualité, il y a certains utilisateurs qui désirent, euh, qui veulent demeurer anonymes pour éviter le slut-shaming, donc le, le, la stigmatisation pour être sexuellement actif, pour avoir un, beaucoup de sexualité. Et euh, dans cette même, même ordre d'idée-là, ça, ça nous ramène au fait que euh, les professionnels de la santé devraient éviter un langage qui est stigmatisant pour ne pas venir renforcer euh, cette stigmatisation-là ou ce slut-shaming-là. Donc, éviter un langage stigmatisant, par exemple, en décrivant les, euh, les applications de rencontre comme étant euh, transactionnelles ou euh, facilitant du sexe animal, comme qui était dans une des, des citations euh, des participants. Sinon, euh, les, les applis qui donnent euh, priorité au corps blanc, au corps musclé, au corps masculin, euh, est un problème important, mais il y a aussi euh, les, les applis, les, les corporations ont un rôle à jouer dans, 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 ce, dans cette problématique, entre autres dans la façon même qui sont, euh, qui sont construites, les applications de rencontre mais au, au premier plan, les photos de profil, donc met une importance première à l'apparence physique et au dernier plan, ou à l'arrière-plan plutôt, les descriptions qui seraient liées plutôt à, aux intérêts ou, ou à la personnalité. Donc, ça renforcit, euh, ça renforcit euh, cette problématique. Sinon aussi, sur les applications de rencontre, à travers des, fonc des fonctionnalités de recherche, euh, certaines qui sont payantes, comme sur Grindr, les utilisateurs peuvent filtrer les profils selon certaines caractéristiques sociodémographiques qui pourraient revenir encore euh, confirmer cette stigmatisation-là euh, contre, contre les groupes minoritaires au sein même des, des communautés de jeunes queer. Donc, on se rend compte que les applications de rencontre euh, bénéficient et s'enrichissent sur des pratiques euh, stigmatisantes, sur des pratiques discriminatoires, et, euh, et il y a là un problème important. Donc, même si les, les applications ont un grand potentiel pour la prévention, un grand potentiel pour la promotion de la santé des jeunes, ça semble que, que ce potentiel-là est plutôt limité par les intérêts lucratifs des, des corporations. Donc, euh, merci d'avoir été avec nous aujourd'hui. J'aimerais particulièrement remercier les 28 participants qui ont accepté de partager leur expérience et de, la, de leur expertise euh, et qui, qui ont contribué au projet de recherche. J'aimerais remercier aussi nos collaborateurs et nos bailleurs de fonds, entre autres euh, les IRSC. Euh, si vous avez davantage de questions, n'hésitez pas. Et puis, euh, le QR code vous amène vers le site web de Collab sur lequel vous pouvez voir les autres projets de recherche euh, auxquels on contribue. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Maxime. On va passer maintenant à la période de questions-réponses. So we're going to go into the Q&A period. We have about a little under 10 minutes left. So if folks have any questions that you'd like to ask at the microphone, please uh, come up. There is one right there. I think that's the only one that we have. Hello. I have a question for Dr. Salloway, um, because you know, you know I won't have any other chance to ask you my question. Um, 
I'm kind of curious about your slide about when you say like 78% of the people will uh, are motivated to stop their friends from conversion therapy, and then you're showing that 11% of the people that are unsure. And then you argue that actually the side of intervention are people, the people that are not sure, but I would argue that actually the 78% is the side of intervention. And I'm just doing some parallel with the suicide work that we did together where we, in survey, when we asked people, do you, would you know what to do? If, would you be able to support a friend who's struggling with suicide? 90% of the people say, yes, I would. But when we talk to people that are suicidal, uh, that had struggled with suicide, they tell us that their friends um, we're not being very helpful. They, sometimes they meet them in very stigmatized ways. So I think, you know, you're, don't you think that the pool of people who could be, we could be intervening with are like the 78% because they're showing high motivation to stop their friends, but I'm not convinced that they would necessarily have the tool to do so. And then also, what do you think, you know, just to kind of my second part to my question would be, what do you think those intervention would actually look like? Okay, how about now? Okay, uh, question one, yes. <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, Bennett Jensen had to leave, but um, you know, a, a number of us, uh, uh, Jordan Sullivan at CBRC, Michael Quag, um, did I see, hi, Faye. Like a number of us have been having these conversations about like, what are we to do now that this ban is in effect? Um, and I agree with you, I think, even if someone expresses to me confidence, actually, I like I feel confidence that if someone came to me, I would have at least some idea how to support them. But I'm going to bump into some barriers really quickly, um, starting with how are you going to find someone to prosecute this case? And if we even put that aside, how are we going to get you to a place of safety? I don't think those of us in, who have the supports can do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm even more worried about those young people who say, oh yeah, I, I would tell them don't go. That's not good enough when all of these things are at stake. So I agree with you. Um, the intervention, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in school-based interventions because we have a good foundation of this here in British Columbia with SOGI 123. Um, our team, as I mentioned, is doing more work looking at uh, school-based sex education. Um, I don't think that's the only site, but I think we need, we need school-based interventions to say, here is exactly the pathway that you, you can and must take if someone is, is considering this. And then we need those interventions to, what Bennett and I were talking about earlier, is we need them to fan out to religious settings, because a lot of people in religious settings are getting pressured into these practices. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really heartened, though, knowing that you know, folks like Wisdom to Action CBRC are looking into like what is legal education going to look like, but it's going to take all of us like bringing those tools into the various settings where we work. So thanks for your question. My question is also for you, Travis. <laughs> My name is Wilbur Turner, and as a CT survivor, I really want to thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, my question is around, you just alluded to it in your, your previous answer uh, to Olivier, but around how do we stop it? And there's a lot of funding that, um, healthcare funding resources that are soaked up that go into programs that actually um, promote suppression of sexual orientation, orientation and gender identity and expression, for example, um, treatment centers. Um, faith-based organizations. And the other part is that there's money that faith-based organizations who support suppression efforts goes into supporting nonprofits that, that provide services to the queer community. So it's a very tangled situation. And do you have ideas on things that, as community, that we can advocate for um, to address those couple of things? What, what was your first name? Wilbur. Wilbur? Wilmer. Wilbur. Wilbur, yeah. um, thank you for sharing that, um, your experience with, with CT. Um, yeah, I, like a lot of us were quite worried um, throughout. It was two years of back and forth with the federal government because of the COVID closure and then the election. Um, and we were quite worried that once 
they did pass the ban, people would feel like, great, this is done, let's move on to the next thing. And we all knew from the experiences in the US, which has 10 plus years of having banned conversion therapy, that no such thing was going to happen. Um, I mean, the very first thing we all need to do, do you live in British Columbia? Yeah, in Kelowna. Yeah, so we can all write to our MLAs like now and tell them that we need uh, legislation and regulatory action in British Columbia to crack down on practitioners who are receiving public dollars to, to administer these practices. We know it's happening. And um, the provincial government at various times has denied it, but we are sitting on people with lived experience and all kinds of data showing that it's still happening. When Florence Ashley was here last month, they talked about how regulators have failed us because um, even though mental health professionals and physicians will say, oh, this is incompatible with, you know, the standards of our practice, they turn a blind eye when it's happening. So we can write to our MLAs, and then in terms of organizations that are getting funding under a tax-exempt status, it is, it, you are not allowed to perpetrate crimes if you're getting a tax-exempt status, so we can also reach out to the CRA and let them know about those organizations, and some of us can do that now. Like, we, ha we have lists of these organizations, so I think the next step is, like, Let's band together and mobilize an effort to actually call out what's happening. It's not enough to put it on the books and say that it's illegal, right? We need to keep finding where these, mm -hmm. where these people are operating. So thank you so much thank for you. sharing that. We have time for maybe one more very quick question. Yes, Dr. Sure, absolutely. Um, so this question is for the person who spoke in French regarding apps and health professionals. <laughs> I, I don't know your name, sorry. Um, so did health professionals find any differences between the different queer dating apps in terms of the effects on queer people? So what I mean by that is you mentioned there might have been an issue with intimacy, lack of intimacy in certain apps, um, the professionals would, would state. Um, but I'm just curious, like Hinge and Tinder are actually quite interpersonal and they allow people to share different details about parts of themselves that aren't related to sex explicitly. Also, you can take pictures that aren't like nude, like you, you see people's faces usually, so that promotes intimacy, whereas Grindr tends to be that more anonymous type of, of app. Um, so did the health professionals distinguish between apps or, or not? The, um, the research focus on like gay dating apps and hook'em apps, including uh, Grindr, Scruff, Hornet, and a few others, if I'm not mistaken, um, and so not, not, uh, not like uh, Tinder or Hinge, um, more specifically related to, uh, to, to hookup culture. And to answer your question more directly, there isn't a lot of data uh, exploring like the differences, but there, I remember from the, uh, the transcript, um, a few participants speaking about how certain apps are preferred by some communities, specifically trans communities, um, that were, um, one, one participant was saying that from their experience, a lot of uh, trans youth prefer Scruff. Um, and so, it, but I, I don't, there isn't there necessarily like a, an analysis really focusing on the differences and how they have different impacts, but. Um, I, I also don't speak French fluently, I just understand it, so that's why I'm also asking, because maybe I'm wrong with my assumptions, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. All right, folks, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today's session. Please give a big round of applause to our presenters.